Yes. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of The Trainer Feed. We have a very special guest for us today, Dan Daly. Um, and before we take it to him, let's see how the guys are feeling. David? How you doing? I'm good. I'm here chilling. <laughs> What's up, everybody? <laughs> What's up? What's up, everybody? YouTube! No. <laughs> YouTube, what's going on? Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's nice out today. I was in the park early this morning. It was really nice. Okay. Angel, are you good as well? Everything's good. Let's get Dan the Mandela. Yeah, on. let's get Dan in the room. Oh, shit. Hey, Dan, how's it going? Hey, Dan. Hey, what's, what's up, guys? What's going on? How you doing? I'm good. How are all you? It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too, man. Good. All right. How have you been this whole... What's up, Dan? The man daily <laughs> in the building. We got him. <laughs> yeah. How uh, how has this whole process been since March? You know, since lockdown. What's that look like for you? Um, you know, selfishly pretty good. Um, yeah, things have been going great actually. Um, it's kind of opened up the whole world of of people being open to virtual training and digital coaching options, um, remote programming, things like that, and being able to work from home and just be more efficient with my time, spend more time with my family. Yeah. I've been remote and all over the place since March. I was in Pennsylvania for several months with my family, just kind of trying to figure out what was going to happen and what was going on. And just spent three months in Europe, mostly in Hungary and Budapest and uh, back in New York city for the last couple of weeks, but thinking of like, you know, what life could look like if we can live anywhere right now and, and um, you know, just enjoying those options. Nice. everyone's safe and safe and healthy so that's really most important that's the most yeah absolutely that's yeah. definitely the most important thing uh i feel we see those pools even though we're not big swimmers those pools look pretty cool and those were in hungary right the ones are outdoors um so a bunch of pools early in the summer were in my hometown of pennsylvania so it's kind of cool to like relive um a summer at home and get to swim in a lot of the pools that i trained and competed in you know as, in high school as a kid yeah um, i bet and then most recently, a lot of the pools were in Hungary, which is really um, like a pool mecca for swimmers. They just have so many beautiful yeah. facilities. Um, and it's just like, you know, where do I want to swim today? And a lot of the facilities have multiple pools. So it's like, do I want to swim 50 meters, 25 meters, indoor, outdoor, heated pool, whatever. It's, um, wow. So you really have a big were, choice. How was the weather over there? Was it cold? It was, if you were swimming outside? Um, so heated pools outside, their weather is very similar to New York city. Um, and they had a bit of, um, they had a warm, a warm fall. So, uh, I, w I was at the, in the lake region for a little bit, largest lake in Europe, uh, Lake Balaton swimming outside every day in this beautiful turquoise water. And it started to get chilly towards the end of that trip. But, um, yeah, I've been swimming outside, um, really since March, actually, when they hold, when they, when everything closed down, I was home in Pennsylvania and pools were closed. So my uncle and I were swimming in a local lake with wetsuits and oh shit wow really like my first exposure to like very cold training even though we had the you know, neoprene on wetsuits but um very cold spring training in open water and then pools open in the summer and I've been able to swim this whole time which a lot of people can't say do you have to swim with mask on or <laughs> <laughs> uh no no I mean there's been some jokes about that and and some articles about whether or not it's safe, but no masks. Your face is in the water most of the time. Yeah. When it's that cold, you feel like you need a mask. That's uh, your most exposed area in the cold water. But yeah. So um, for our listeners who haven't had the, the opportunity to either walk or learn from you, tell us about what your path into the fitness industry has looked like. You mean from like the beginning? Yeah, let's go from the beginning. I know me and you have spoken a little bit about where you started off, but yeah, for our listeners, let's see how, where you started off to where you got to now. You know, I feel like I tell this so often, um, <laughs> it's almost like boring and I'll try not to ramble, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I was always really into strength and conditioning and nutrition as an athlete, a multi-sport athlete growing up. And um, about halfway through college, I decided that I wanted to make a career out of that. I was always kind of like a resource for friends and family. So I changed majors, changed schools. Um, and started studying kinesiology at Westchester University, where I continued to swim. I got a degree in exercise science and uh, minored in nutrition. And then shortly after that, got a personal training job in the Philadelphia area and kind of cut my teeth there, getting some exposure, working with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and decided I wanted to move to the city and make a career out of that. And so I did. And um, 
worked for Equinox for 11 and a half years, just kind of climbing the ladder there through the tiers, through our education department, um, to some extent through group fitness with the EQX H2O program I created and um, had a really fabulous uh, like working career there for over a decade, um, training clients one-on-one, group fitness, working with other professionals, helping them develop their business on the curriculum side, lecturing, doing some management, um, pretty, pretty diverse um, skill set there for that period of time and um i really look back on that time i really enjoyed it it was um it was quite an experience and i think it's fair to say that anyone who's been a trainer at equinox in the last five to ten years has at least some point gone through some of your lectures as you were just touching on what if and then for, for those who don't know you were, were you not ahead of the fti for the education and the programming is that right in saying that uh, so no, I wasn't head of EFTI, but um, uh, I was a global area coordinator. So so we had 14 education markets across that program, and we had you know corporate directors and um, executives managing the program. But from like a day to day operations, setting up the schedule, coordinating master instructors, managing them to some extent, um, payroll, I was involved um, at, at that layer, and you know also doing a quite a bit of instructing as well. So lecturing for two hours most days out of the week and and being a big part in the curriculum development for that and the implementation and, and the development of the other instructors teaching it. Yeah. I feel, I feel every, every time I was going to another tier, you had, you had lectures in whatever tier it was. And then it's just a little unfortunate the timing that me and Angel weren't tier rex completely the same time as you, cause I'm sure we would have had some opportunities there to, to mesh even more. I know we've done a couple of workshops together, so but it is, it is what it is in its life. And it's still been a great bit to be able to, to learn with you. And um, I wanted to veer that question. So you mentioned, you know, long ago with Equinox, you're doing your own thing. What, so how has that started and where can you see it going in the next say five years? Uh, yeah, big question. Um, You know, so for the last several years, I'm just wondering like where my career path would go, whether or not I would take more of the corporate route, you know, working for a corporate fitness company, or if I wanted to be more of like the guru trainer um, and really my own brand. And that I've been kind of cultivating both and like in parallel um, all of that time. And um, it's all the pros and cons of both. But I decided that maybe about a year ago, 18 months ago, that I really wanted to pursue and develop my own brand and and pursue some of the interests um, that I just wasn't able to fulfill in my current roles. And so I'd kind of been setting some of the wheels in motion for that. And um, the whole pandemic and, you know, everything that happened in March was just very coincidental because I was, I was putting a lot of those systems in place to begin with. And I was, I was really able to just kind of, you know, pull a lot of those levers and run with it from the, the minute the gyms closed and we all went home. Um, so, you know, primarily what I'm doing now is, you know, managing my coaching business. So my bread and butter is still working with clients one-on-one. Um, but as you, as you guys all know, there's a limited amount of time and hours that we have to be able to see and, and, you know, the reach that we're able to have working with people one-on-one. So I'm, I'm trying to scale my remote programming business and I'm doing that through um, several tiers or offerings just to get in front of more people. And I've really doubled down on swim as my niche and which took me a long time. I was very much a generalist and always had the swimming background and, and was coaching swimmers and endurance athletes, triathletes, marathoners. But um, I'm very much focused on swimming now and still coaching a lot of, you know, general fitness one-on-one, but um, in terms of programming, marketing, some of the workshops I've done and ones that I want to continue to develop, it's really going to be focused on swim, open water swimming, triathletes, um, endurance athletes. So, that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, in terms of, in terms of, you know, living remotely and the gyms being, you know, less accessible. Um, I'm coaching people virtually one-on-one. Um, I'm doing some group workshops virtually. I'm programming for people. I was fortunate to be able to do a workshop this summer in person, like a really small invite only thing at one of the local pools in my hometown. And that's something I'd really like to run with when travel and, you know, social distancing resumes is, um, be able to do workshops, retreats, and clinics all over the world in beautiful water and um, coach people and be able to lecture and, you know, do all the things that I enjoy in the industry. That's awesome. I could definitely see myself, even though I've never been much of a swimmer, go into something like that because I could learn so much from, from those kinds of workshops. And I actually want to 
uh, let Angel chip in because he had some questions in that sort of realm. Yeah, sure. there was, I, I wanted to pick your brain about uh, a lot of things, but first and foremost, it's a, uh, it was a privilege to be educated by you. Um, so it's always good to, I know when you had that Equinox, you know, it's been 11 years post or whatever, people were posting like crazy and some people posted like sentimental stuff. Some people joked around, but I sat there in the comment section for about like five minutes going back and forth with, should I have like a dry joke or should I just like not say it? Cause it's not going to read, it won't age well. You know, or if somebody yeah. else who doesn't know you, they see it and they're just like, oh, no. But anyway, all that's to say is uh, it was a privilege to be educated by you. So um, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Moving to my questions, I have one serious question about uh, the apps that you've been using in order to uh, kind of continue to program for your clients. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reaching a similar kind of wall or I'm seeing the wall. I might not have hit it yet, but I know that the wall is coming where you only have a finite number of hours in a day. Um, and you want to try to maximize that as much as possible. Uh, are there any apps that you've been using in order to program for your clients? And then I'll talk about the, the silly question. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of apps out there and they're, they're all in their infancy. And um, I think they're becoming more popular and, and it's just great that people are, are more open to this, but um, I'm using an app called train heroic to print, to program for my clientele. It's something I landed on from some recommendations from other people um, it has a little bit more of a strength and conditioning focus and might even be kind of designed for like a team-based approach, but you can do a lot of one-on-one, -on -one. um, give clients their homework for clients who you might be meeting one-on-one. -on -one, you can give them homework through the app. It's, it's app facing. It's the user interface for clients is really great. Uh, and then remote clients, you can write them programs. It's self-administered, message them through the app, share videos, feedback, things like that. Um, for endurance training, <clears throat> Training Peaks has always been um, kind of the gold standard for endurance-based programming. So it's really popular with triathletes and marathoners and to some extent open water swimmers. So I'm using that a little bit more. Um, the integration with like Garmin and some of the the, uh, the wearables, particularly in triathlon and open water that athletes are wearing is really nice with Training Peaks. So I'm using that. And other than, I mean, those are probably the core programs. There's a lot of like integrations I'm using. Um, you know, digitizing my business and working remotely and online. Um, I'm using a lot of different services and kind of aggregating a bunch of my offerings all together with that. But Train Heroic's the main programming app, yeah. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah, I've, I've been bouncing around with a couple of different ones like Coach Now. Um, Bridge <clears throat> Athletic is also another one that I heard. Um, so I'm starting to use that too. So I'm, I'm gonna take a look at Train Heroic to see what that looks like. Uh, go into the silly question. Uh, can you teach anyone how to swim? That's what probably anybody who's listening to this wants to know. You know, I, th I think yes. And, um, and truthfully, I, I feel like a lot of times people look at my content and they think it's very performance based. And I'd like to think that it is, but a lot of the people that I've been coaching for the last 10 years have been adult onset swimmers who either can't swim at all and want to learn to swim or who is like can kind of swim if they like fell off a boat in deep water, but they want to learn to swim for fitness and, or do their first triathlon and they have the run and the bike down, but they don't have the swim down. So I've helped a lot of, a lot of people who can't swim or may have swum in high school, but they want to do something with swim and fitness and um, really just helping them look at efficiency and the mechanics of it and, um, and teach them, you know, proper mechanics to leverage the fitness they have because some of them are so fit in the gym and they're so fit on the bike but they're not able to tap into that because they don't have the skill and the coordination of swimming so yeah i'd like to think i can teach anyone to swim and i probably spend more time on the efficiency of swimming for adults than i do on the performance-based stuff that's awesome because i can't swim i don't think david could i swim. can't swim either uh you gotta, you gotta I, I can so we're, we're at 50 percent right now yeah um yeah. but Does i did water in the uk Anyway, the UK is sorry. an island, but anyway, go <laughs> I on. Mean... Anyway, go on. <laughs> anyway, uh, can you shed some light on negative buoyancy? I think that's the term. I don't know. I think I heard it or I read about it, and I was like, yeah, that's me. But I forgot what the term was. And is it is it legit or is it not? Are people just, like, making stuff up? Well, I've never heard that term before, but, it, like, some people are like, oh, I'm a floater or I'm a sinker. And there's some truth to that, and there's a test I use to help people kind of uh, the analogy I like to use is people are either helicopters or gliders. So a helicopter, like if it stops spinning, it's going to sink. So learning 
that if you're a helicopter, you might need to spin your wheels and have a higher cadence, higher stroke rate, higher kick than other people. Or maybe you're a glider, uh, I'm a glider, and um, my stroke rate is going to be a little bit lower, but it's more powerful. And, um, I'm, you know, I glide and kind of stretch out the strokes for a longer period of time. There's pros and cons to both. Some of it's based on body composition. Some of it's based on your body type. Some of it's based on your inclination. Um, but everybody floats, you know, we're 70% water and a tremendous amount of body fat. Um, even the leanest of us is quite buoyant. Your lungs hold two liters of air. You know, there's a lot of things that you can leverage and a lot of it's body position. So the you know, fight or flight, it's like doggy paddling, wanting to keep our head above the water, which really puts you in this uphill position. And then you're just dragging yourself across the water. It's um, so you're, we're working against ourselves. We're just so inefficient. Human beings are very, very inefficient in the water. I don't know if maybe a couple of fun facts, but like how, in terms of efficiency, how much energy do you think human beings waste in the pool or in the water? 80%? Shit ton. More. More, More than, than 80? 80? Wow. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm doing a hundred, so I can't even say. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember I, I, did so, a, no, I did a Spartan race and we had to go through on the lake. So it was up on like Mount Vernon. It was years ago. Nice. Never knew how to fucking swim. And then they're, the, they're, the lifeguards were like, just throw yourself in the water. We got you. <laughs> I'm like, I, I was like, I, I couldn't throw myself. It was, it was, but when I was in the water, I was, I was not, I was just winded in like two seconds because it was just like, I didn't know what the hell to do. So I'm just like going crazy. But they yeah, I mean, it's me. full body. Um, when you go anaerobic right away, it's, it just feels like the hardest thing ever. Um, to answer the question, the best swimmers in the world are like 90% inefficient. So 10% wow. efficiency, they're turning wow. into forward, forward propulsion and then the average person is like three percent efficiency so wasting 97 percent of their energy um just as a point of comparison i think like dolphins and fish are like 20 percent efficient so not much more but they are more streamlined and sleek and then their propulsion is more efficient than ours but we're just like dragging our mass through the water so the more you can be streamlined and horizontal the more you're going to float and the more you'd be efficient that's what some of my friends have been telling me. They're just like, you need to uh, just kind of put your feet behind you as opposed to underneath you. But it's almost impossible to your point about the fight or flight. You just want to keep your head above water. And I can only imagine like it's something where you're, you tell your clients to squat deeper or something like that. And they put their head lower to the ground and they keep their hips like at the same point that they were squatting, the same depth that they were squatting to before right? To give yourself the perception that you're doing something different, but you're just not doing the same thing at all. You're just completely out of it. You bring up a really good point. Um, so like I was, I was a collegiate swimmer, but I didn't really know how to coach swimming. And then I got into the coaching world and like, like we all spent a lot of time coaching and really honed that craft. And, you know, for like five, I don't know, five to eight years, what I was really trying to do is, is translate my coaching skills and a lot of those cues that you were just describing into the pool. And, you know, all the things that we think about with position and external cueing and proprioception and, and feedback. Um, so there's a lot of great cues and, and great tools that you can use in the water to help you be more successful. And I think that's most exciting for me is bringing that coaching skill and that coaching aspect to the swim world and helping people like yourself who are like, you know, you can probably bike and run pretty well. And maybe like everyone wants to check the triathlon off the list, right? Or maybe a marathon. And um, I don't know, help people add that swim component. I think that's what I'm most excited and passionate about. That's awesome. Uh, and it kind of leads to my next question. Uh, how did you find your niche in fitness with all like the vast areas and uh, kind of like all the things that people think about when going into the fitness world? How did you find swimming? Uh, well, it took me, I was just a little bit sick of it after college. Um, you just put in a lot of time and wanted to do something different and learn new skills. And I wanted to spend more time in the weight room, just kind of like selfishly. And, you know, as I began to enjoy that and see the results and the benefits, I wanted to continue to share that with clientele. But, um, you know, like seven years ago, I transferred to Columbus Circle and they had a pool. And I was able to begin focusing on that. And I was really one of the only coaches at the time that had coaching experience. So, you know, I started I started appreciating that skill that I had and how much other people wanted it and how I could use the best of what I was learning as a coach with the best of what I was able to do from a swim standpoint uh, and marry the two. And then just became known as an endurance coach for that and helping triathletes and people who want to do open water events or just learn to swim as we've been discussing. 
and then saw a real opportunity of um of being able to to marry smart strength and conditioning with swimming because a lot of endurance athletes are not lifting weights and they don't they don't see the benefits and they're not able to make time for it uh and a lot of the the functional assessments that we look at there's things that if you can't do them on land you're not going to be able to do them in the water and just telling someone to get their feet up more or put their head down or get their arm up over their head maybe they can't do that functionally anatomically so taking a look at some of the assessments that we all use and and really value on the gym floor on land and translating that to the water uh that also speaks to kind of who you are right like you were saying that earlier that you were trying to blend um, the education with what you're doing now with training. Uh, maybe you can be the next person to create like the FMS for the water. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if, um, I don't know if my ego is that big to say that, but I do see so <laughs> much. Um, it is pretty big though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the daily special new assessment comes soon. <laughs> You know, when we, when we get into specializing, we sometimes get very narrow minded and like very myopic and kind of tunneled with our approach like swim coaches, like, you know, at one point I thought I might want to be a collegiate swim coach and for various reasons I didn't pursue that, but they're very good at, at coaching on deck and I don't want to dismiss like all of them. I'm generalizing a bit, but they don't know as much about strength and conditioning. And then at the university level, you have great strength and conditioning coaches, but they're often very focused on the, the big the big time sports that are bringing in a lot of money. Um, so like, you know, your footballs and your basketballs and some of the female sports and they're writing good programming for swimming, but it's not as focused. So I think there's a huge opportunity in, in the swim world, we call it dry land. We call strength conditioning for swimming dry land. It's like you're out of the water and that's been traditionally done on deck and the tools are becoming more innovative, but there's a big opportunity to get very smart about strength training for swimmers and and even look at some of these sports that traditionally didn't have a lot of strength and conditioning that we're now we're seeing more and more of it. Like what sport can you think of where like, like NASCAR drivers realize how strong they need to be golfers. Um, oh, yeah. We're just seeing so many people really recognize how important strength and conditioning is for their sport. And there's still a big opportunity in swim to do that. And um, I could, going on a tangent a little bit, I'm not even sure what the original question was, but I, I see an opportunity for that and I want to be a part of it. So the creating some type of system, it's like I am developing a little bit of my system, but I'm really just taking best practices from other things, which I think um, Equinox has done so well for many years of their education is bringing the best of FMS and functionality and other modalities, Viper, Kettlebell, and not just being um, uh, like a one modality type of approach, but being able to marry all those best practices and you know, to maximize what you want your niche and your single modality to be really good at. Yeah, that's awesome. I was, uh, so many thoughts came through my head that I forgot all of them simultaneously, but I think he, that's the Dan Daly effect, right? He'll just yeah. put all that stuff in there. Uh, but speaking to your knowledge, uh, do you have any reads that you would recommend uh, for people in the fitness industry or for uh, self-improvement? Because even clients can benefit from self-improvement in relationship to fitness or relationship into how they uh, treat their lifestyle. So have you, do you have any like on deck or anything that are your favorites? Yeah. Um, I guess it depends on like what area that you want to focus on. I've kept a running book list for a long time. When I get asked that question, I just email people a list of books and you're kind of, you know, what areas do you need to develop a little more and where you could be reading up on? I'm reading um, Lane Norton's Fat Loss Forever right now, which I feel like is pretty popular. Um, and it's been sitting on my desk for a while and I kind of would start paging through it and, and not finish it, but I'm, I'm making a good effort to, to get through that. And, um, you know, there's just so much noise and, and nonsense in nutrition. And uh, I like, I like his no nonsense approach of cutting through that noise. And, and I'm very much evidence-based and I want to know, you know, what's the latest and greatest that we know of from a research standpoint um, to know the facts, but then knowing the facts is only half the battle. The precision nutrition is um, just so great in my opinion for learning the art of coaching and, and being able to coach someone and get to kind of the root of their why and their um, that behavioral change psychology, I think is, is really the most important regardless of the knowledge you have. It's crazy. Um, the precision nutrition certification, I thought it was at the end of it, you would teach your clients how to cook. Um, as a tier one trainer, I saw all these tier three plus trainers saying, oh, you got to do this and steak with this and this down the third. And I here's what I'm gonna, 
Yeah, they're like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you a list. Actually, I'm not going to send you a list. So I'm just going <laughs> to tell you, steak, salmon, this, that, and the third. And then as I continue to progress, and then I got to Precision Nutrition, uh, I, I won't say I was disappointed because I didn't think I was much of a cook myself, but it helped me understand uh, habits and how important habits are. Uh, but that's another tangent. So I'll let David take it from here if he wants to ask some questions. Yeah, um, I had a question. My, my questions are sort of more general fitness related. Um, in terms of what you've seen throughout your years in fitness, uh, and like you said earlier, just you know, strength and collegiate, athletes and strength and conditioning coaches giving you know new sports a certain way of doing things with in regards to strength training what do you think are some of the trends that you see had the biggest impact when it comes to changing the way a person trains or a person looks at their programming and if it's been beneficial or or detrimental to an individual's performance you know um uh, the study's probably old now, but um, there was a study in the, the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research that the NSCA puts out, but they studied a population of football players that had, were strength training for, over the course of their four-year career. And what they found was they all um, got a lot stronger, like focusing, you know, the traditional football lifts, like benching and squatting and deadlifting, but none of them had to increase their power. And, you know, when we look at what's going on in the field, it's submaximal forces done very fast, reactive, explosive. Um, so in my opinion, power is probably the most important attribute for athletics. You know, whether you're an NCAA football player or you're, you're a client who wants to run the first 5K, it's just so important. And just kind of the, the, I don't know, the arc that I've taken with my strength training is I was sick of swimming after college, but probably in my best shape, like right after that. And wanted to spend more time in the gym and put on some muscle mass, um, not have to do 20 hours of pool time every week. Um, and Damn, you start really focusing on strength training. And then you get into like our world and so much of our colleagues and our, our peers are really into like heavy, heavy weights and, and very linear things and being strong and putting on a lot of mass. But what I found was I, I just didn't feel good doing some of those things. And, and then what took me a really long time was some of those things just weren't good for me. Like, like squats are amazing. Um, but there's something about like bilateral barbell squats, that axial loading and being like under that bar that just doesn't work for like my hips and back. And it took me a lot of trial and error of like kind of tweaking things and injuring myself to realize that maybe that wasn't the best lift for me. Um, and, and realizing that I feel best when I, when I feel powerful and quick and athletic and I'm, I'm spending the majority of my time developing energy systems um, in the pool, with some of the cardiovascular stuff and supporting that with strength training, but not, you know, maximal training. Um, but then, you know, doing a lot of power training. So I'm, I do a lot of kettlebell work, um, plyometric work, viper, th viper stuff, some Olympic lifting, but not a ton. Um, and just kind of exploring like what it means to be athletic and quick and reactive and feel light and young and looking at some of the research of how like we lose power as we age and, um, you know, just exploring that and, you know, finding what's best for the person. And you know, we do that, I think sometimes by like managing ourselves and, and looking internally first, but so to answer your question, like power training and like athletic training, functional yeah. training to, for, to use an overused word. Yeah. I mean, Not that, that any of the other stuff is wrong, but, um, <laughs> yeah, no, what's uh, best for you, I guess. I've realized with the whole pandemic and, you know, lack of, at least for myself, barbells and bumpers. And I, I mean, I've been competing in Olympic lifting for, for a number of years. And I found myself once we reopened in, you know, early September, it was like, I don't feel great. I mean, I'm used to, you know, the cleans and the snatches power and, and I felt, you know, a little bouncy, you know, felt a little more athletic. And now it's just like, shit, like what's going on. And then, I, you know, side note, I did, I hurt myself not too long ago. And that kind of like sideline everything because my dumb ass is like, oh, you know, let's get back to, you know, deadlifting 335, 350, like nothing, but no, as uh, I think the, the pandemic is a big eye opener for a lot of us. Um, and in, in terms of sports specific training, I've seen from my experience, and I really wanted to ask you this because I saw this in the gym not too long ago, you know, a person on the seated, seated cable row, like the, the, the unilateral uh, cables, they were uh, laying on their back and doing kind of like a breaststroke with the weights like each side. And then I overheard them talking to a friend of theirs and they're saying, Oh yeah, you know, I'm just trying to get better at, my, at swimming. Cause they were at the JCC next door and they're like swimming. 
What do you think of that? What do you think about when it comes to people doing or modifying certain things they do in their sport into the actual weight room rather than doing, you know, yeah. the other stuff? I love that question. So to almost talk out of the other side of my mouth a little bit, I almost feel like there is no sport specificity. Um, at least until you've mastered the basics. Mm -hmm. So there's so much fitness to be developed by focusing on the right squat for you, the right deadlift for you, pushing and pulling. Some of the specificity is very granular and, you know, you know, loading, loading a backstroke pattern might have um, validity, but it might not be the place where that person needs to start. And in terms of specificity, probably the best place to be very specific with swimming is, is in the pool and spending yep. time swimming. Yeah. It's like, you just need to swim more. And because swimming is so easy on the body or easier than other things, there's, there's a ton of volume and just a ton of reps and a ton of mastery that you could develop by spending lots of time in the water and, um, and kind of getting to a place where you realize maybe I can't spin my arms any faster. So if I don't get stronger, I'm not going to get faster. Um, that's something that takes hours and hours um, to realize. So in terms of specificity, yes, there's things to do. And from a marketing standpoint, you know, I probably post a lot of specificity for swimming, but then also if you look at it, it's like, yeah, you could do that for anything or it has carry over to all these different um, activities. Yeah. In terms of that exercise, I don't know. I can kind of picture what you're saying. And I use some tools that where maybe we are loading some of those patterns, but also maybe that person just needs to press some more weight overhead and, and can they do a pull up and squat their body weight? And maybe that would have a bigger return. Yeah. I guess we look at percentages of return and specificity, it starts to get narrower. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, in the summer, I think who was it performed better had the summer series. And I think I listened to Mike Boyle speak about if you want to get better at a sport, you do the sport, you know, and then you, you go into the weight room and you get stronger, you get faster. So I don't know that just one, one of my one of my things you see people in the gym, you know, practicing their baseball swing or their golf swing with, you know, with the, the cable with machine. a mace. With the mace. <laughs> <laughs> with a mace or with, or with anything, you know, with a kettlebell. Um, and I don't know, like for me, I, I was always, I'm always very interested in, you know, maybe what their reasoning is behind it. And, and it goes back into education. Like there are a lot of people that aren't as educated, you know, to do certain things. And it's hard because now, nowadays everybody online is doing certain things and, you know, you don't know which, where to get your info from, you know, and I think or Angel asked about your, your resources. And I think it's good to just, I think, reach out to the people that know, you know, um, wait, uh, before you, before you go to the next piece, I thought that, uh, so Dan has on his Instagram, these Instagram videos where at the top he's doing one thing and at the bottom he's doing something else. Yeah. Um, and there was one piece of cardio equipment that replicates rowing. I guess it's a breaststroke. I have no idea what any swimming, uh, style is but you were doing something i'm just gonna do so the youtube people are gonna get a kick out <laughs> you're doing something like this and i thought that you had adapted the ski erg in order to do that and i was like did he like is he like macgyver and he just like you no know, like put it on the side up. yeah i thought he took it over <laughs> to the side was holding on to one and i was like and i saw him doing it and then i was like no but then he had to use an ergonomic rower because he's sliding backward and forward right so you got that i was thinking that was on your belly like you got the rower seat on your belly <laughs> and then you're just doing this with the ski erg um yeah. and i was like this is unbelievable until you like posted it or something like that in a different angle i was like oh wait that's actually like a concept uh two, whatever concept two, product. Yeah. yeah concept two product uh, yes, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up so I can plug it a little bit, but, uh, I've been, um, I've been partnering with a, a company Vasa trainer for, um, earlier in the year, it was something I wanted to incorporate with a swim programming in Equinox. And it was something that I used in high school. It's, um, it's a swim specific ergometer. So it's similar to concept two, but you typically lay prone or supine on it. You can, you can do what David was describing. You can do a backstroke stroke. Um, they have a couple of different products. They have dry land cords or just resistance bands with um, paddles. And their uh, swim benches are, are very similar to like bench presses, but they tend to be sloped and maybe a little narrower to, um, to kind of give you that posture, but allow some of the freedom of movement. And um, the ergometer is just a super cool toy or tool rather. Um, the fan-based ergometer hooked up to a power meter and you're able to replicate your strokes and get some cardio development on it in a swim specific way doing a lot of the prone, like freestyle, butterfly, double arm, single arm stuff, but backstroke, a little bit of breaststroke. 
um, it's a fabulous tool and it's something I've been collaborating with them a lot this entire year and was able to train a ton on their products um, in my home gym, in my garage gym, you know, during the whole shutdown. Uh, I'm a big fan. I was really happy to have those and I would love to coach more on those and create content and, but yeah, it's, it's called Vasa trainer. It's a swim specific, Pretty cool. it's a swimming ergometer. You probably had Angel, because uh, Angel ordered a lot of equipment, as some of us did in lockdown. But I was ready to see Angel kind of get the Versa, get the Versa climber, or the Angel's gonna get everything, man, and get a bench and just like kind of get as close to mimicking as possible. I need if if that's the case, I need to get my body ready for water first. I need to stop doing the the doggy paddle sort of situation. I need to get more horizontal, um, and before I can even think about getting something like that. So um, this man, Dan, so when we, uh, a couple of years, we, me and Angel went out West, David, we wish we brought David, but that's another story. Um, I'm over it. We're, we're out, we're in, we're in Los Angeles in the Hills and the, it's an old client of mine. She had a, she let's say her house, she had a pool in the back and everything. And Angel tells me he doesn't, he can't swim. And I was like, oh, come on. You should have pushed him guy, in. Oh man. This guy can swim. And he said, and, um, you know, like he's in the deep end. It's oh, you know, just dive in, or whatever, and you know, I'll I'll get you, whatever worst case scenario. And I mean, I didn't. I had a fear of diving even when I when I've been able to swim. So kudos to this guy. But he just he dived and he just was just sinking, sinking, sinking. And yeah, it was pretty bad. Was I, just, I think I stopped moving at one point because I was like, oh wait, I forgot to breathe in before I actually jumped in the water. Like I was just so. <laughs> I didn't think it mattered at that point, right? You were just pretty much a corpse, just flowing to the bottom, <laughs> sinking to the bottom. Sorry, right. I think he's good. <laughs> So that, to be that fair, was... <laughs> you were the only person who actually said that. I've had a lot of people say that in my life. They're like, oh, go ahead, just jump in and I'll help you out. And you were the only person who actually helped me out. I wasn't just going to leave you there. Everybody else is just oh kind of like, you know, you're, you're just sinking. You're just like, oh, no. you feel a thud. You feel another thud. The light at the end of the tunnel, you start to feel euphoric. And then before you know it, you're back up. But you actually like grabbed me. So uh, I, yeah, I wasn't going to let you die. So you're welcome. You're here to tell the tale. Oh my god! I don't think you ever still told me that story. I mean, you're telling the tale. I ain't saying shit. <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from that. <laughs> oh, that so you knew you couldn't swim, and you dove in anyway. That's that's even ballsy. though you have done this multiple times before, and other yes. people have not helped you. But you're like, maybe yes. this once, I'm gonna dive in, and maybe I'll miraculously be able to swim, and maybe having... Jack will help me if I can. <laughs> I was having a rough week, so I was like, how how, <laughs> how like, much worse can it get? I'm done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how much worse can it get? <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's ballsy though, right? I think if you're if you're someone that has, I mean, I don't know if this is fair to say that if people you've coached with, if I I, don't, I wouldn't know if you would would you coach on diving or would you strictly just swimming? Even though diving is when you enter the pool, is that something you would cover? So for competitive swimming, diving is a huge component of the race. Diving off the starting block. Um, I'm not coaching a lot of competitive pool swimmers anymore, so I don't coach a lot of diving. But if someone wanted to learn to dive, it's definitely something we could cover. And is um, I actually have my mo most experience teaching children how to dive. So it, like it's like the fundamentals. Um, sitting on the pool deck sometimes, kind of like tipping them over into like a cannonball or a, um, a shape like that. But um, yeah, t t uh, diving can be taught. It, it hasn't been taught much. You know, uh, we also have a lot of shallower pools like in the city tend to be like three feet deep and not that yeah. conducive to diving if you're not familiar with it. But um, I do teach some of it, but more in the competitive realm. Is there benefit oh, when, when parents throw their kids into the pool and just leave them there to fend for themselves? No. <laughs> that was one of my clients, is, she used to be a swimmer back in high school too. And she was like, yeah, my, my parents just threw me into the water and said, all right, learn how to swim. I was like, yeah, no, we're not. We're never doing that. Don't trust um, them with your kids. <laughs> this um, that's kind of the folklore, but swimming's not very innate for humans the way it's innate for other animals. Um, yeah. How particularly freestyle i didn't know this but sorry how about when you see babies do it or videos when, when babies are, are swimming in the water so it's often referred to as like waterproofing and there's a couple of programs that are um that are popular for it but you know kids who can barely walk and can't even talk yet can learn how to swim and a lot of it's um teaching them they're so buoyant and particularly like the counterbalance of their head but teaching them how to roll over on their back and face up to the ceiling to get air and then they can kind of like paddle and walk themselves to the side I did a lot of that in college. I worked for a really great program, but it was like a two week intensive for all ages, but particularly like the two year olds and younger drop them in at the end of two weeks. And they learn to roll over as I was describing and kind of push themselves to the side, you know? So if you were, you had a child who was at a pool and fell in, they'd be able to save themselves. 
if someone didn't happen to see them. That's insane. Wow. Well, I don't think it has to be learned that way though. I have a four year old and uh, he actually just learned to swim during the pandemic. He was, um, he turned four in April and couldn't swim. He, he, he couldn't really swim. And now he like, he's like a fish now and <laughs> swam almost every day all summer and into the fall and just loves the water. But we didn't push it from a young age and people would always ask, like, I'm sure your son's a great swimmer, but he, he didn't learn until he was four. He didn't learn until the spring. What's an average age to have someone learn? You mentioned two-year-olds, your son just turned four. What's a healthy age you think would be if 30 you years ever old. get that? Huh? 30 years old. <laughs> age <Yeah. seven. laughs> I don't know what the average age is. And I was conflicted about like forcing and like traumatizing my son a little bit because that, yeah. that intensive program is um, it's kind of like a boot camp and you're doing it to, to like potentially save their life. But mm. I don't know, maybe it could also create like a traumatic, like psychological, like a deep psychological thing as people get older. I think my son learned I mean. in a really healthy and natural way. Mm. I don't know what the best time is probably young, like learning any new skill, but I've been working with a lot of adults and teaching them how to swim. And I think everyone should be able to, I think it's, it's just like a fundamental skill. Right. So I would love to see you guys in the pool. I'm when buying a 48 pack, Dan. 48 pack. I'm able to get on deck. <laughs> We're doing it four yeah. times a week. At 6 a.m. Get ready, At David. 6 a.m. I'll do it. <laughs> Pull my bathtub up. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Um, I had a question in terms of um, RPE training. Um, is that something you've ever used? Is that something you you – you would, you know, recommend for somebody. I've heard different stories about, you know, it not being optimal for, for strength training and other people using it and not, not really getting to their full potential. Yeah. Uh, I've actually been spending more, giving it more attention over the last nine months. Um, it seems to be becoming more popular. Like I, we see the trends and, you know, we explore like, we, we explore all the different options. And then at some point you're hitting plateaus and you're like, Oh, what if I use RPE as a scale to maybe manage my progress and help me push through plateaus and adapt and things like that. I think I've always kind of used it intuitively as just like a subjective scale. I love asking my clients how they feel on a scale of 10 or how hard was that on a scale of 10 and correlating that to like percentages of load. Inevitably, when you ask a client that they always give you like a word, it's like, how do you had that feel on a scale of one to 10? Good. It's like, well, could you quantify that for me a little bit? It's like, you know, if it was a six, we'll go up a little bit if it was a 10. Yeah. So helping them kind of um, have an appreciation for those intensities. And, and even in cardio too, a lot of those percentages translate the same. So yeah, I'm using it a little bit. When I started to dig into the science and um, I forget the, the, the guy's name, the coach's name, who's really made this popular. But what I found was it, it wasn't so much of a science. He just kind of created a system around it and um, helped kind of correlate some of the things that I was describing too. So yeah, I think it's valuable. Um, I feel like it's more popular in the powerlifting and Olympic lifting community, and maybe they're really able to really dial it in in a way that I don't understand and haven't used. Um, I'm just kind of using it in a general way and, and have an appreciation for some of the systems that are out there. Yeah. I mean, I've used it a couple of times and then I, I found that sometimes I would tell myself that it's too much when I know it's not, if, if, whether or not I'm feeling good that day, you know, and I found that it just hasn't been at least for me, beneficial. Like if I, if I have a program written down and I need to do a certain number, I, I try my best to do it rather than tell myself, I don't feel like it, you know, RPE 10. We're not doing that, you know, <laughs> I'm like that. But but I think it's it's good to, the whole scale about asking people how they feel from one to 10, I think is a great way to do that, that I've seen what my clients like, you know. Um, I have one more question. I mean, we just, I just heard that restaurants are closing here. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, they're they're closing. Wait, um, today? Yeah. Monday. It's closing Monday. I got to get my frijolitos. Bravo yeah, knows about that. <laughs> well, it's probably still takeout, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I guess. guess. Oh, yeah. We'll be able to dine at our favorite neighborhood restaurant tonight together. Oh, damn. All right. <laughs> this is the last weekend to do it. Yeah. No, but um, what if you, if somebody comes to you and asks, you know, what kettlebell should I buy? You know, I, I, I myself bought a couple of bells during the first, you know, lockdown. I remember I ordered a kettlebell and it came like two, three months later. It was the, it was the worst thing. <laughs> Listen, man, it was a setup from the jump. So Dan, this guy, this guy ordered kettlebells and he was like, guys, you got to get these kettlebells, blah, 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 blah. And when we looked at the link, we we're like, all right. And then it was like, oh, they're cheap. And I was like, well, that's the first thing. That's the first flag when they're cheap. And the second I one, cheap. I said, they're a great price. <laughs> they're great, they're great, cheap. Very good price. They were cheap. And then the second one, 
was that they were going to ship it as soon as it gets to them. As soon as they create it, they're going to ship it. wasn't even made yet. And I, and I thought to my head, I was like, this oh just sounds like a God. setup. And I our, got... RKC, our, the RKC bells. And I went through... So they want uh, you to believe. Yeah, I went through... Yeah, oh, right, exactly. Right? It's probably not. I went through Rogue, and I got my stuff through Rogue. And it was kind of like a hassle because you got to like... You know, you had to find that everything was going like off the shelves really quickly. And it was a higher price, and then you got to pay shipping and handling. But I got my stuff within that week or like two weeks later. And David was like two months later and he didn't even get like he got like a handbook or something like that for kettlebells or something like that what do they give you a workbook listen coloring book listen <laughs> i ordered the thing and they gave me 50 percent off an online you know kettlebell stuff and i just like why mm-hmm. not but hey i got them i got them and it's it's all set i gotta get them out but back to the question <laughs> what okay. would you say what would you ask uh, for for a man and for a woman like if they say i want to get a couple of bells what weights would you get for, what would you recommend them getting? Because I think that's the biggest question I get from my clients is, David, I want to get bells, but I don't know how heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've been really my go-to training source this whole period. I was a big fan of them, but they're just so versatile and small. And the footprint is small. Um, I don't know. I hold it a lot in the standards for RKC and Strong First based on weights, but like a 16 kilogram for a lot of women and 24 kilogram for guys. And then I've, I've been a huge fan of um, offset loading and, and getting a, a bell size up or down and, and pairing those for when you want to go heavier and just going bilateral with those offset loads. So maybe like 12 or 20 kilograms for women and 20 or 28, um, you know, sometimes heavier or lighter depending on the person. But I've been training with two bells this entire time. And when people are limited to that for themselves, I think you can, there's just so much versatile training to do with two good quality kettlebells. Um, yeah. And then I have clients who have bought entire racks of kettlebells and I've been fantasizing about like a home in the suburbs and, and outfitting a proper gym with like a good, you know, a good kettlebell rack. But I'm training with a 24 and a 28. Um, yeah. And I actually, I'm really proud of my training over the, this whole period using those and just really maximizing those skills. Yeah, no, I, I found myself, I have a 28, I have a pair of 16s and a pair of 20s. They've been... And then I did, uh, I was trying to do 500 swings a day. And uh, these guys remember, I think I got COVID the next day. So <laughs> from the swings, now, if you, you know, the first episode we had, I was coughing up a lung. It was ridiculous. Oh my God. But yeah, no, it was <laughs> kettlebells have been a game changer. I think uh, offset loading is a T-Rex thing too. Cause my mentor, Mike Monroy, he was, uh, he was doing some offset kettlebell stuff and he was like, yeah, you should give it a shot. And then I did it. And I felt like, a T-Rex coach. I just Wasn't picked it? up the two kettlebells and somebody's like, oh no, that one's definitely smaller than this one. I was like, like yeah, that's the point. That's the point. And then boom. Yeah. And then that's, squat. uh, it was, it's not Phil McDougall's, uh, big focus Probably. as well, isn't it? He yeah. Really- so f- yeah, oh, Phil's a big fan of offset loading and, um, we were all able to do a workshop with him in February. It was the uh, maybe first and last and only workshop I did all year, but um, yeah. he just really speaks to the science and the benefits of offset loading. And then, you know, if you're only going to recommend two weights for someone, it's just made so much sense over the last two months or last several months. So I got to give him a ton of credit for that. Um, yeah. And I know Mike has worked a lot with Phil and um, he's a terrific guy and just a really smart programming around um, kettlebells and some of the other um, what's the word. Um, not non-essential, but untraditional forms of loading and loading tools. Yeah, he works a lot with uh, maces and F sandbags. Phil, Phil McGregor does, right? I want to say. Yeah, Indian yeah. clubs, things like that. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the one I was thinking. Because uh, that uh, that workshop, um, he also spoke about the the science behind someone seeing better progress or performance if, as opposed to having. Um, a pair of 20 kilos having 116 and 124 the fact that even though you're still lifting the same load the fact that it was unevenly unevenly distributed on each limb was um was was part of the reasons why someone would see better um uh, would see a better improvement in their performance um and goals i think he spoke about as well that was sort of the the his point i, I want to say right yeah, faster strength gains and just the instability and the um, 
the increased like neural stimulus from your brain trying to have to figure out, you know, why this is so uneven, but you're trying mm-hmm. to do the same thing with both. And then when you want to go heavier, you have two moderate sized bells. You can get a decent amount of load with, uh, you know, a 24 and a 28 when you want to swing two bells or clean them. I'm not snatching 24s and 28s, but. I don't believe it. Phil, uh, you, know, Phil yeah, you, you, you snatch 28. Come on. Well, I meant double 24 and 28. At the same oh, time. double. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Bilateral yeah. snatches. My bad. Yeah, that'd be a lot, actually. <laughs> For I me, still think you can do it, though. I don't have the core control, to be honest. I just jam right into extension, and um, I'm increasingly, like, just super critical of position and, and some of my movement flaws, particularly as I put myself out there and, like, video content all the time. I'm like, wow, I need to um, mm. I need to do that a little better. It doesn't look so good. You can't, yeah. You're some... not supposed to arch your lower back extensively and torque when you do a snatch. Okay. Well, I was just going to jump in and say, I, I think you, um, you, you real. I think if you can, I mean, never, there's never going to be a time when we record and post something that it's a hundred, hundred percent. And there's always, there's two things. There's always going to be maybe a little deviation from perfection because we're not perfect. We're human beings. And there's always going to be, I don't know, maybe this is more in the beginning. I thought of this, but there's always going to be someone ready to criticize, <laughs> shred it. And usually David is one of those people. Um, I was doing I was doing some swings. Somebody told me I had ashy feet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some. But the, Angel, you posted something, that, and the, some of the comments because it had been a while since you posted, and they said, "Oh, it, you should you should try this." And and well, and there's a, if someone really butchers a technique, I think there's a safer way or kind of way of going about it as opposed. to blasting them in comments but it but going back to your They're point comment Dan, comment shaming now we gotta we gotta no, fight back no, no, we gotta no, comment no. Sh- we gotta get, turn get, off get, all get comments butter. Cool, of course. yeah for real i need to <laughs> butter and I need to turn off all my comments <laughs> but That's my I, was, I was just gonna say though it's and it's quite it can be quite humbling as a coach if if, if you think because how we think we move and then how it looks like when we move whether it's the our hips is more shifted or we think our spine is completely a neutral or aligned, but there's a little bit of deviation. It's it can be quite humbling and quite eye opening, and it sounds like you've you've kind of tapped into that as well, like that realization that oh wow, I didn't. Like you said maybe it takes more than one take to film something. Um, yeah. Right. It's or like, I did a whole post on um, on corrected after I watched the extension I was going into on bird dogs. I was like, wow, I'm really hinging in my lumbar. So um it kind of um it co- took a different path and i started discussing that and some of the things to look out for but yeah we we could all probably move a little better and um i think there's a tactful way to have those discussions but 100%. people love to fight on the internet you get these armchair coaches that <laughs> yeah armchair coaches are like that <laughs> oh well we want to i don't know if angel you had any more questions or no just uh i'm looking forward to seeing that reading list i need to see that list yeah um email me you know i feel like that was a draft in my um my equinox email so i may have lost the the email but um i certainly have a list of books and that's and updated too so um okay we can talk about it i have a bad habit of accumulating books that i start and don't finish that's (laughs) my entire bookshelf here books i haven't finished it's true i'm on i need one more chapter to finish this book and i've been on this chapter for like three months all right, well, email me when you finish that chapter and I'll give you another one. Damn. Okay, I got you. <laughs> oh, damn, it'll be a book. It's a book. <laughs> oh, man. If I had a video of when Angel did that in LA, it would have been amazing. Um, we oh, want to think- There is there is video. Go to P. Diddy's, uh, or, <laughs> yeah, P. Diddy's Instagram account. There's a video of him diving into a pool. That's exactly what it looked like. <laughs> so anybody who's uh, who has Instagram, just check that out. Or share the other feed. No, but Dan, we want to thank you so much for taking the time and um we're so excited to see what you're doing post equinox because we feel like you did so much and achieved so much there and your following is growing as well which is awesome to see because i feel you're possibly the only one that's at least in my in my circle that's bridging the or marrying the training and swimming together so it's quite refreshing to see that it's it's you're the only one i follow that that does the only one that i know yeah i'm not seeing that at all likewise yeah, I mean, like I said before, I think there's an opportunity in that space. And then I've kind of found a niche to present that in a unique way. So, yeah, it is taking off. And to what how you guys kind of mentioned, some people just like to watch swimming even if they don't like swimming. Um, the underwater video is pretty cool and 
clients love it, uh, particularly when you video them. But yeah, so I found a niche there and it's really taken off and having to market yourself and promote your own business now, that's a focus for me. So it's been successful. Maybe, uh, you know, Brett Contreras has his name on Instagram as the glute guy. Maybe we're going to have one for you, like the swim guy or something. I don't know. Yeah. No? Yeah, we'll see. If you guys come up with that, let me know. I'm open ideas. I'll, I'm, I'm looking for a marketing manager. The All right. Guy. Well, you're talking to the right people. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your last good to name. chat with you guys, though. Yeah. yeah thank yeah. you, man. I was about to say, your train daily, swim daily, that might be another one, That's too. Like, you have a know. great name for that too so you definitely yeah, have the marketing series. like yeah you got the look you got the name everything's like going <laughs> in the right direction oh man appreciate it yeah where can people but, find out more about you i uh, love well, my website traindaily.com d-a-l-y you can find me on instagram dan daily um and a bunch of other outlets youtube um facebook things like that awesome cool awesome. All right. So I'm flattered we'll, you guys invited me and it's good to just catch up and chat and see, see you. Like I, uh, we haven't seen each other in so long, so it's good to just talk. And, um, if I can be a resource for any of you guys, I'd love to talk more swimming, whatever books, uh, let me know what I can do. This of was course, awesome. man. Thank you. I'm sure we'd love to have you on again in future as well, when you're probably, you'll be so far out of the hook, ahead of the curve by then, but we'd love to have I'm you on sorry, again in the future. Sorry, who are you? <laughs> i don't know these guys i don't work for you guys anymore <laughs> now we have the recording so this is evidence yeah. so we get to <laughs> thanks so I'd much happy to. i'm glad it. you guys are doing it yeah you're welcome thank you thanks, thank man. you thanks, take care dan thanks, see you. Man. talk soon talk soon that was awesome that was that was pretty phenomenal yeah dan the man daily what yeah. what can you expect calm calm collected and just full of knowledge just filled with it yeah no it's it's good to uh it's good to kind of reconnect with him i haven't seen him in a while haven't heard from him um but seeing him on ig all the time doing mm. so so many things that are unique and so many things that are influential in the right way right Last you see time a lot I saw of him was during an EFTI class that was what fucking years ago yeah. You said how many years ago? You said years ago. When I was oh, you said the, twenty years yeah. ago. I said, David, you're only twenty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> She's only really twenty years ago. Yeah. I know you've been at Equinox for a lot for a, of a lot, nine years, but I didn't realize it's twenty-nine years. Nine years. <laughs> nine years. <laughs> he built this place. He built it from the ground up. He <laughs> was born in the shit. Sorry, that's no funny. Hell yeah! At seven years old, he just started laying down bricks. Yeah, you know, Hispanic labor you know, laws. Wait, David, we have to tell him the story when. I was on the floor shift and she was on the front desk and this guy brought his kid in. He was just letting his kid go on all the equipment in the gym. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this guy was having like his two-year-old. I went up to this guy. I went up to this guy. I'm like, yo. I said, hey, excuse me. You can't have your kid on the treadmill. He's like, I'm just showing him. I said, yeah, but it's against policy. Right. It was like two years old and he had him on the pull-up bar. He had him on oh the fucking God. assisted pull-up bar. Oh, my God. They don't even fit. Like, how no. does that even happen? No, he just put them up had... there. Oh, he just left like them. a monkey. I'm like, no, no, get him out. They just... do have really good grip strength. Yeah, but the assisted pulling machine is a little dangerous if a kid just falls on yeah, the steps. <laughs> this guy's just like, hey, let's make the hardest thing in the gym. <laughs> Fair <laughs> point. <laughs> Dude, pull up. So then... Get it also... on the rower, too. <laughs> Damn. This guy, I came downstairs. I said, David, this guy's guy's getting all the equipment. David was like, God damn, I told this guy not to come in. <laughs> Yo, that was so yeah, fucking no, he funny. Was, he, so... he, his excuse was he was going to uh, trade him, let the kid use the bathroom. <laughs> I mm. think that's what his excuse was. The kid was. just jumped on the pull up bar. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I mean, yeah, he, didn't come back. he didn't come downstairs for like 10, 15 minutes. I'm like, what did this kid have to do? You know, like, you, and then I went oh, and you had to go it. find them. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. And then Jacques is like, oh, he's up there with the pull with his kid. I'm like, fuck. He said, yo, he's just snatches the kettlebell. <laughs> he's got the baby kettlebell. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that, oh, that reminds me of. Bring the dog. Remember that? What's up? I, rem I remember that. Lady used and to bring that, a dog. There was also, um, really? whatchamacallit, yeah. like in, in sports club, there's that, uh, the kids day or something like that. And sometimes oh. you see them, like running around. I mean, I don't think it's happening anymore. Just no, it was at one point though. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was weird for me too. That, that was like a little adjustment. I was like, what are all these kids doing in here? Like it wasn't it was just a Sunday or something, wasn't it? Yeah. They were just like running around and I was like, what is going on? But yeah, I, I guess it's, it's not made for kids. No, too funny. But, um, uh, I, gotta finish right? reading, 
I got to finish reading that book so I can get the book recommendation. Yeah, Dan's going to send you that over. Damn, wrestling's already closing tomorrow? Oh, Monday even? Monday, yeah. Damn, what'd you get? You got the you got the plug? What's going on? That's the Andrew out. Cuomo tweets. I just looked no, it my up. Friend, no, my friend told me, and uh, they were like, oh, yeah, we're clo- they're closing Monday. Let's go get drinks before that. I said, no, oh, shit. David going to get COVID again. Jesus freaking Christ. Be careful. Damn. Don't, I would say be careful. I can't say, I can't tell you what to do. You're a grown man. Grown ass man. You are I guess man. we might do one more one more restaurant before this shit happens. You're the one uh, getting those kettlebells three months after you ordered them. <laughs> Grown ass man. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of fake ass website is this? <laughs> yeah. I paid for my meal. I'm still hungry. <laughs> anyway. Let's uh let's wrap, let's wrap it, up. it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Uh it was great. Check out the YouTube, like, subscribe, all that jazz. You guys are doing a great job on uh liking and following us so far, so continue to do so. Thank so you for the love, guys. We appreciate us. it. Don't just like the damn pictures. <laughs> <laughs> he has right. got a point, but yeah. <laughs> anyway. Bye, guys. All right, later. Bye-bye. David?